Robotics by Elena Domain. Essential question. How do robots solve problems? Working robots. There are a lot of places we'd like to go but can't. Dangerous places, distant places, inaccessible places. We can explore these places by sending in robots. These mechanical adventurers have computer brains that don't feel fear or panic. Killer levels of radioactivity, no problem. The black airless vacuum of space, the crushing pressure of tons of ocean water, tiny path through ancient rock, Bring it on, say these brave new robots. Andrews 5, for example, handles life bombs for the Baltimore, Maryland Police Department. Rosie was built by a team at the Carnegie Mellon University in Pennsylvania. It can safely roll into highly contaminated nuclear facilities and wash them down or take them apart. Howden might be considered Rose's baby brother. This robot can enter hazardous waste storage tanks to clean them. You want me to go where? In 1994, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, teamed up with scientists at Carnegie Mellon University and the Alaska Volcano Observatory. They sent a robot to explore an active volcano. Scientists explore volcanoes to learn how they work and how to read the warning signs of a volcanic eruption. An eight-legged robot named Dante II climbed down into Alaska's Mount Spur, 90 miles, 145 kilometers west of Anchorage. Dan's job was to explore the crater floor and take gas and soil samples. It was something that no human could have done. Dante's designer knew the descent would be very tricky. The north wall of the volcano has a 1,000 foot, 305 meter drop. The south wall is steep and covered with rocks. Designers gave Dante servo motors, mechanisms that help Dante's main computer. The servo motors allow Dante to raise and lower each leg as the robot climbs over rocky surfaces. Dante's foot pads and legs also have sensors. The sensors keep it from crashing into rocks or falling into holes. But even with all this technology, nobody trusts Dent to make its own decisions. Dent was connected to its human team by satellite and the internet. Its main computer analyzed every step before it allowed the robot to go forward. Eventually, Dent reached the floor of the crater safe and sound. As Dent gathered samples, the robot's camera sent a three-dimensional view to the computer screens in front of the scientists at the volcano's ring. And thanks to something called Virtual Environment Vehicle Interface Software, the scientists felt as if they were right there in the volcano with Dent. But a near-perfect robot adventure ended in a way familiar to anyone who's ever climbed a steep hill. Dante slipped in some loose dirt on the way out of the volcano and could not climb out. The science team had to call in a helicopter to rescue the robot. Dante too makes its way beside a river in Alaska. Analyze the text. Sequence of events. What step does the author describe in Dante's adventure? How does this section provide clues about what you will learn in the overall section? 
Unfortunately, no one can fly to Mars to save robots that get into trouble. NASA landed twin rover robots Spirit and Opportunity on Mars in 2004. The robots were sent to explore the planet, collect soil and rock samples, and take pictures. Spirit and Opportunity are all alone on the red planet. They are millions of miles from Earth. And Mars is a far more hostile place than the inside of a volcano. Mars is very cold, averaging 67 degrees Fahrenheit negative and 55 degrees Celsius negative. Its strong winds whip red dust across the rocky surface of the planet. The rover's connections to NASA is tricky too. Communications between the robots and NASA scientists are sent through millions of miles of space. The information travels via computer connections to orbiting spacecraft and antennas on Earth. As the rovers roll across Mars, any helpful messages from their human teammates on Earth are delayed by several minutes. So the rovers are designed to make many of their own choices. They are given jobs, but it is up to them to figure out how to get them done. The rovers are also have a survival instinct programmed into them. It helps them adapt to unexpected situations. The exploration rovers collect rock and soil samples and take photographs on Mars. The Incredible Shrink Bot Scientists at the California Institute of Technology are working on the designs for a tiny snake bot to travel through the human gastrointestine system, the stomach and intestines. As a doctor looks down a patient's throat for swelling or other signs of illness, the snake bot would look at a patient's insides. A camera and sensors would help the snake bot gather medical information for doctors. The snake bot's information would help doctors diagnose disease. It may even help in therapy. But it, without question, the tiniest and most daring medical robots are being designed in Sweden. The Swedish microbots are smaller than the hyphen between micro and bots in this sentence. The microbots are made of silicon. The silicon is coated in gold and then covered in polymer, a plastic compound that can shrink or swell. This allows the pieces of the robot to bend so it can pick things up and move them around. The Swedish microbots are designed to operate in all kinds of fluids. The research team imagines a time in the near future when a microbots can be injected into the human bloodstream. Doctors hope the microbots will be able to clean up the plaque that causes heart attacks and break through the blood clots that causes strokes. The microbots could also remove bacteria. One day, they may even fix disease-causing cells. In the old sci-fi movie Fantastic Voyage, Five scientists and their submarine, the Pratos, were shrunk to microscopic size. They were injected into the bloodstream of a fellow scientist. Their mission was to reach a blood clot in their friend's brain and save his life. What Hollywood imagined as movie fantasy in 1966 is become science fact. Miniature robots from New Mexico's Sandia Laboratory also explore tight spots. Sandia researcher Doug Adkins designed the miniature robots to work in swarms like insects. 
They communicate with each other and with a central station. Artesy Robots The Sony Corporation's Creo Robot took center stage literally in March 2004 when it conducted the Tokyo Japan Philharmonic Orchestra. Creo can perform many tasks, but Sony, a Japanese electronic company, wanted to show off the robot's ability to control its motions. Creo held a conductor's button and led the human musicians through Beethoven's Symphony No. 5. Japanese automaker Toyota has also proudly produced a musical robot. The Toyota robot can play when you wish upon a star on a trumpet. Toyota says it hopes to soon have an entire robot band ready to belt out tunes. Who's got the ball? Robots aren't all work and no play. On May 4th, 2003, robots from around the world played soccer in the International Rub Cup Federation's America Open. The event was held at the Carnegie Mellon University. Hiroaki Kitano established RoboCup in 1997. He hoped that it would lead to the development of a robotic soccer players good enough to play against human athletes. That first 1997 tournament was a little chaotic. The robots had a tough time finding the ball. They struggled to recognize their teammates and figure out which goal they were supposed to aim for. As engineer improved the robot's vision system, play improved by the 2001 games, the 8 inches 20 centimeters tall, Will the robots in the small league were doing better. They played the two 10 minutes halves on a field the size of a ping pong table. Their soccer ball was an orange golf ball. The Sony Corporation sends its able team to the open. Most RoboCup players are two legged, but the ables are little robotic dogs. The ables kick the ball by getting down on their elbows. This position allows them to use both front paws. Play is slow and a bit goofy. The ables are, after all, still amateurs. Creel was designed to test controlled robotic movement. Able's robotic dogs compete in a RoboCup soccer game. Bertram, your robot butler, rolls into the living room and says in a flat voice, Dinner is served. You are slouched down in the corner of the couch. I'm not hungry, thanks, your answer. Your parents or friends might ask if you feel alright or if there is anything they can get you. But Bertram has no reaction. He simply rolls back into the kitchen without a word and puts away the uneaten dinner. Bertram has understood your reply, but he can't respond to your tone of voice or your body language. And most people, Alison Bruce discovered, really don't like that about a robot. Bruce is a research at the Robotics Institute at Carnegie Mellon University. Bruce is part of the Institute's social robot program. The program studies ways to improve interactions between humans and robots. In Bruce's experiment, a laptop computer was attached to a robot. The robot stood in the hall of a college classroom building and asked passing students a question. Sometimes the laptop screen would be blank, but sometimes it showed a face with a range of expressions. Bruce was not really interested 
the student's answers to the questions. What she was interested in was the student's willingness to stop and talk to the robot. She found that more students responded to the robot when it had a face. Like Bruce, others who work with the robots have realized that humans prefer robots they can relate to. They have developed robots that can show human emotions such as anger, happiness, embarrassment, and sadness. An experimental domestic robot from the 1970s works in the kitchen. A student pauses to talk with one of the social robots at the Carnegie Mellon University. I feel, therefore, I am. Kismet the robot was designed and built by Cynthia Brezzo, a research at the Massachusetts Institute of Technologies, MIT's Artificial Intelligence Laboratory. The lab is home to many kinds of interesting robots, but Kismet is not like the others. This robot can display emotion. Kismet leaps can pout or smile. His eyebrows can arch and his ears can wiggle. A combination of clever computer programming and sophisticated engineer has given Kismet the ability to actually respond to a stimulus in an emotionally recognizable way. If you say words of praise to Kismet, he will smile. Bright colors also earn a smile. So does his own reflection in the mirror. But raise your voice and scold Kismet and his lips will sink into a frown. And when Kismet becomes overstimulated by too much noise or movement, he will withdraw, lowering his eyes and taking a kind of robotic timeout. Kismet is lovable not just because of his blue golf ball sized eyes. Kismet interacts with people and shows he has understood them through his facial expressions. His success is in relating to people may be reflected in the fact that everyone refers to Kismet as he instead of it. Kismet was developed to interact with people. Heads will roll. His name is David Hanson. In 2003, he showed up at a science conference in Denver, Colorado, carrying a head. The head was backless and bowed and bolted to a piece of wood. But it was still pretty. It had high cheekbones, blue eyes, and smooth rubber polymer skin. Hanson said, the head down on a table. He plugged it into his laptop computer and tapped a few keys. Everyone stopped to watch what would happen. Moments later, the head began to move, turning right and left. It smiled, sneered, and frowned. Hansel, a robot scientist at the University of Texas at Dallas, called the head K-Bot. K-Bot can mimic the major muscles in a human face. It has 24 servo motors under the, its specially developed skin. Digital cameras and its eyes watch the people who are curiously studying it, and software helps it to imitate what it sees. David Hanson designed K-Bot to express humans' emotions. Analyze the text. Domain a specific vocabulary. When the author uses a term such as polymer skin, she is using language specific to her own field of study. How does the author help you understand this term? What other technical words does the author use? How can you figure out their meanings? Hanson has built several robotic heads, but he isn't the only one. In Tokyo, Hiroshi Kobayashi's face robots, as he calls them, 
are also yearly lifelike. So is the head sitting on Fumio Hara's robotics lab at the Science University of Tokyo. Hara's robotic head can scan the face of the person standing in front of it. Then it can compare the face to those in its memory bank. Once the robot identifies which of six emotions the person is expressing, tiny machines under the robot's skin remold its face to mimic what it is. For Hara, heads are just the beginning. His goal is to design a robot that is interactive, friendly, and most of all familiar. But do we really want a robot that looks just like us? Maybe not. In the late 1970s, Japanese robot engineer Masahiro Mori did some fascinating research on how human beings interact with the robots. Mori discovered that people like friendly looking mechanical robots, but Mori found that when robots look too much like humans, people stop liking them. Mori called this sudden shift the Uncanny Valley, the place where people begin to feel uncomfortable with the human-like robots. Fumio Hara poses with the skeleton of one of his face robots. The face robot's network of wires and pulleys is covered with a flexible skin. Experience is the best teacher. Engineers have begun building robots that can adapt to their environment. They operate on what are called patterns of behavior. Most of these robots are quite small and behave a lot like insects. Insects don't really think. They rely on their sense and instincts to find food and survive. Like insects, the little insect bots have been equipped for sensing their physical environment, but they have not been pre-programmed with any data about their environment. So when they are first turned on, they are brainless. But the insect bot's computer are programmed with separate layers of behavior. The behavior layers help an insect bot learn about its environment. The more it learns, the more it can do. Once the insect bot has mastered one layer of behavior, the next higher layer of behavior kicks in. With each layer, the insect bot gets better at dealing with the world around it. At MIT, James Mark Lurkin has built robot ants using these layers of behavior. But McLurkin's ant bots are even more amazing because they are able to signal each other when they find ant bot food. In other words, the ant bots learn how to work together to achieve a shared goal. The ultimate ant bot, however, is yet to come one that can communicate with the real ants. A robotic ladybug developed by Senior Electric Company sits on a leaf. I believe, says Hans Moravec, a research professor at Carnegie Mellon, that robots with human intelligence will be common during the next 50 years. Certainly, the Center of Intelligence System, CIS, at Vanderbilt University in Tennessee shows how close we are getting. The CIS has developed a robot called Isaac for intelligent soft arm control. Isaac can express emotion and has both short-term and long-term memory. And because he, this robot's brain has been designed to think much like ours, Isaac may soon actually be able to dream. It seems almost certain that in the future we will share our planet with the robots. 
What we build in the lab will have the potential to become as smart as we are. It may even improve upon its own technology. Will we love these robots or fear them? Time will tell. Isaac was built to help people who have physical handicaps. Improvements focus on learning skill and response to human emotions. Analyze the text, main ideas and details. What is the main idea of this selection? What details does the author give to support the main idea? Will robots obey the laws? In the informational article you just read, author Elena Domain asks whether the future's highly intelligent robots will be loved by humanity or loathed and feared by us. The answer to these questions may hinge upon whether robots can either be designed to regulate their own behavior or somehow restrained from breaking certain basic rules of behavior. Fans of science fiction are already familiar with one proposed set of rules to govern robot morals and keep our robotic servants from become our masters. In 1942, science fiction patriarch Isaac Asimov, in a short story titled Run Around, enumerated the three laws of robotics, which were thenceforth integrated into much of Asimov's future fiction involving robots. The three laws form an interdependent series and may be paraphrased as follows. First law of robotics. A robot may not cause injury to a human through the robot's actions or allow a human to be injured as a result of the robot's failure to act. Second law of robotics. A robot must obey the edicts or orders of its human rulers, unless such orders would cause the robot to violate the first law. Third law of robotics. A robot must not allow itself to be eradicated or destroyed, unless its own self-protection would violate the first law of or the second law. Here is a theoretic puzzle for you. Can you imagine any scenario in which the three laws of robotics, if built into a robot software so that it was forced to follow them, would not ensure the safety of humanity? If robots obeyed Asimov's law, could we feel secure with them working, playing and living among us?